Hi everyone, welcome back to Computer Science 340. This week we're talking about algorithm analysis. Now algorithm analysis is basically the study of how efficient or inefficient different algorithms are. Oftentimes, if you have a given problem, there's more than one way to solve that problem, right? And so the point of algorithm analysis is to compare those different solutions and be able to like definitively say this one is more efficient than this one or this one is more efficient in this circumstance and this other one is more efficient in this other circumstance to be able to be like able to confidently talk about how efficient things are and do so in like a definitive sort of like uh, objective kind of way without just saying well this one should be faster but be able to make some kind of like strong statement about just how efficient things are now today we're going to start talking about that by talking about why we don't just use the amount of time that a program takes to run. We'll look at comparing different programs with execution time as being the, the sort of the factor we look at. But then we're going to talk about why we don't actually do that in computer science. It's very rare to say that this algorithm runs in X amount of seconds while this other algorithm runs in Y amount of seconds. That's actually not the metric we use. Instead, what we use is something called big O notation which is essentially a way of talking about how the algorithm, how the time required for it scales up as you start using bigger and bigger input sizes. And so that's what we're going to start talking about today, this big O notation. Then in the next part of this module, next uh, video, we're going to talk about sort of the mathematical basis for it. And then in the last video, we're going to talk about some examples. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about what we mean when we talk about comparing algorithms. All right, so we're going to begin by actually talking about execution time, which, as I said, is sort of a naive way of doing algorithm analysis. And it's not the way we're going to finish up doing. But I want to start with doing something with execution time so that we can kind of see how it works. And then we'll begin talking about the flaws in it and why this isn't actually the main way that people compare algorithms. So I have two programs that basically do the same thing. The first one adds a bunch of integers to the end of a singly linked list. That program is here. We have our sort of basic singly linked list class where we only have the next reference and the head reference. And we have a method to add to the end of the linked list. And we call that a bunch of times, however many times the user wants by passing in args zero, that's going to be used to determine how many integers we're going to add to the linked list. So if we pass in like 100 when we run this program, it's going to add 100 integers to the end of a linked list. And here's our method for doing that, that append method. We, with the singly linked list, have to basically loop to the end of the list in order to find the last node in order to append it onto there. Now, when we talked about doing this, we said that this wasn't very efficient. And so today we're going to sort of quantify using both running time and then also with big O analysis, just how inefficient or efficient this is. So that's the first program. It adds a bunch of numbers to the end of a singly linked list. The other program does the same thing, but it adds them to the end of a doubly linked list. With the doubly linked list, we have the next and prev links, and we also have head and tail. So now our append method doesn't need to loop through to the end. It just goes right to the tail node and then goes ahead and accesses it that way. The actual main program does the same thing. Whatever argument the user passes in when they run the code, the program adds that many integers to the end of the linked list. So let's go ahead and run these two programs and see how they compare. So on the Linux command line, you can put the word time before any command and it'll tell you how much time it takes. So now I'm going to time running this add single program. And oops, I forgot to give it to the argument. So let's do it with 100 and see how long it takes. It goes very quickly. The total time is given right here, the user and system time. Um, it's not really important right now, but those are different things. The total time is the actual like amount of time the program took to run. And it's in seconds, so this is less than a tenth of a second to run this. Now let's go ahead and increase it a little bit to 1,000 and see how long that took. Just over a tenth of a second. Let's go ahead and increase it some more to 10,000. And now it took about twice as long as that, 0.2. Let's go ahead and say, I don't know, 50,000. 
and see how long this takes. It's starting to slow down, which makes sense. You know, the more numbers we have to add to the linked list, it's going to take more time to do. This time it took about three and a third second. So that was for 50,000 items added to the end of the linked list. Let's go ahead and do 100,000. Yeah, it's 100,000. And this will take significantly longer. This is an exciting video. This is the last one I'm gonna do live. After this, I'll just cut it down so you can see <laughs> what the results will be. All right, it finished, 13 seconds. So it's taking significantly longer the more that we add to the end of the singly link list. Now I'm going to double that and do 200,000, but I'm gonna edit the video so that you don't have to wait for this whole thing to finish. Okay, so it finished up at 53 seconds, so just under a minute to do this. Um, that's one of the nice things about uh, having a video like this. You don't have to sit through the whole thing. In class, we would have had to do that. <laughs> so that's maybe a benefit. All right, so that's 53 seconds. Now let's do one more thing and increase this to 500,000 just one more time. And again, I'll cut this next part out so we can just see the result and not have to wait for it. Okay, and this sucker finally finished. It took 10 and a half minutes, <laughs> basically, uh, to finish running. And so that's how long it took if we increase the size from 200,000 elements added to the end of the link list to 500,000. A pretty big difference, you know, over 10 times as much time. Now let's try it for the doubly linked list. Let me go ahead and clear the screen and then I'll do time Java add double. So this should be faster. Let's go ahead and do it with the same different numbers of elements as we did last time, which would mean starting with 100, which finishes in less than 10th of a second, just like last time. Actually, interestingly, this took a little bit longer. So the first one took 0.069 and this one took 0.097. So for adding just 100 nodes to the end of a linked list, it was actually faster to do it with the singly linked list than the doubly linked list. But spoiler alert, that's not going to be the way it goes for very long because when we do it for a thousand, it takes actually less time. And so I'm gonna get to this in a second when we talk about why we don't use execution time, but this really doesn't make any sense at all for it to take less time to add a thousand nodes to the end of a linked list than it did to do for a hundred nodes. And in this case, I think the reasoning behind this is that the first time you run a program, it has to load that program's code up into the computer's memory which takes some amount of time. But if you run it right again, right after that, it doesn't have to do that because it remembers that program's code. And so it's stored in the instruction cache of the computer. And so when we run programs like this, there's a lot of like specific things about the computer that come into play. If we run this again, it might take even less time. And you can see that there's a little bit of variation here. But let's continue with the experiment. After 1,000, we went for 10,000. So let's go ahead and do that. It takes even less time than it did for 100 still. Um, again, because these are very small amounts of time anyway. So the fact that the program's already loaded in cache made a big difference. After 10,000, we went to 50,000. So let's go ahead and do that. It still is going very fast. Now let's go up to 100,000 which takes a 10th of a second, 200,000, which takes just a little bit more, and then 500,000, which still takes less than a second, just over a quarter of a second in this case. So there's a few takeaways I hope you get from this. One is that the differences in efficiency between different algorithms are sometimes like really huge in terms of the actual practical effect of it. Doing this task of adding nodes to the end of a linked list, when it was a singly linked list, Doing 500,000 took over 10 minutes, but with the doubly linked list, it takes just over a quarter of a second. That's a humongous difference. Something else I hope you get out of it is the fact that when you repeat multiple runs, it can take different amounts of time. So when we did this thing here where we did it for, what was it, 1,000, it took 0.093 or 76 or 77 or 75. If we did it yet another time, we might get a different number out of it, 0.082. 0 0.086, 0 0.085, is that the same one? Uh, no, that's actually, it was a thousand that we did it for. So you're gonna get slight differences and variations each time you run the program, that's perfectly normal. And you're also going to have weird effects that don't really make sense. 
like it taking less time to add a thousand nodes than it did to add a hundred nodes. All right, so here on the notes page, I have some numbers. This is figures from when I ran it last semester. So I did a live and we got slightly different results, but it doesn't really matter. The same uh, basic idea comes to play. And again, something to take away is the enormous difference as the input sizes get larger, despite the fact that for small input sizes, it didn't really make a difference. Less than a thousand, there was no real difference between these two different approaches. But it's as the numbers get bigger that it starts to make a bigger and bigger and bigger difference. So why don't we use this? Why don't we normally do execution time to compare different algorithms? Why are we going to do this big O thing that we're gonna start talking about today? Well, there's a few reasons. One is that you can only really compare two algorithms. So if you just come up with one algorithm by itself, like if you just see the singly linked list thing and you run this test and say, okay, well, it took 18 minutes to add 500,000 nodes. If you don't have anything to compare that to, you won't have any sort of objective measure of how efficient adding to the singly linked list is. Is that good? Is that bad? We don't really know. There are so many factors at play. What kind of computer are we running it on? It's, it's not really an objective measure to just say 18 minutes for the singly linked list. By itself, that doesn't mean anything. It's only if you have something to compare it to that you can say, oh, wow, this really sucks, you know? So that's one problem. With timing, it only really helps you if you have some kind of baseline to compare it to. Another reason is that there's a large variation in the time it takes to run a program. I already kind of talked about this. When we did this, we saw that some cases, the time went down even though we were doing more work. And if we ran it back to back, then we would see that it took different amounts of time to run the same program. The reason for that, again, is because the computer is running an operating system, which is running lots of different programs, not just the one thing you're testing. And so you have to take that into account. Another reason is that it only gives you a measure for the whole program. If you were going to want to compare two different individual algorithms, then you would have to write a program like I did that basically just tests that one thing, which is a bit of work. As we're going to see, you can just look at a specific algorithm inside of a larger program and do the analysis on it. And also you need to test multiple input sizes. If we only tested up to like a thousand or even 10,000, we wouldn't have seen that this was such a big difference. It's only as we did the bigger and bigger test cases that we saw it was a problem. So that's why we don't use actual running times of programs to compare and to do analysis because the results are sort of like chaotic based on what else is happening on the computer system. And they're also so dependent on your particular hardware. I was doing this on a virtual machine, which isn't very beefy. If you had a powerful gaming computer, you would probably find that these numbers would go down. And so the actual amount of time itself doesn't really matter. All right, so if we don't use running time, what do we actually do? What we actually do is we analyze the algorithm itself and we figure out how it scales up as the input size gets bigger, because that's what we really care about for algorithms. We don't care about what happens here in this table. We only care about as the program gets bigger and works on bigger and bigger input sizes, how does it scale? This scales super, super well. We could have increased this a lot more and it wouldn't have even taken hardly any time at all. Whereas this scaled relatively poorly. As we got larger input sizes, the amount of time taken by this program is going up and up and up and up. And if we did this for a million next, we could sort of infer from this table that it would take maybe half a second at most with this algorithm, whereas this one would take gosh knows how much time, an hour, an hour and a half, we wouldn't, uh, I don't wanna run that because <laughs> I don't wanna tie up my computer that long but it would take a long time. And so this one is scaling worse than this one is. That's what we care about in algorithm analysis. And so to figure this out, to figure out how it scales, we don't actually have to run the program. Instead, we just need to look at the algorithm and do a little bit of thinking and reasoning in order to see how something is going to scale. So here's the algorithm to add to the end of a singly linked list. It's given right here. We talked about this when we did linked list, of course. We make a new node and put the data in. We set the new node's next field to null. If the list is empty, we set the head to the new node in return. 
Otherwise, we search through the list from the head node looking for the last node. And so if we, we go ahead and check if this node is last, and if it's not, we move on to the next node, scanning through every node in the linked list until we get to the end. Then we finally set the last node's next field to the new node that we just created and return. So what we're going to now do is basically examine how many steps this algorithm takes as a function of how big the linked list is. So let's come over here and do that. So let me go ahead and copy our algorithm onto here so we can see it. Okay, so there we go. And so like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to think about the size of the linked list, which I'm going to mark as n, and then we're gonna think about how many steps does this algorithm take given that our linked list is this big. And let's start off with n equals to zero, sort of for like our base case. Well then let's see what we need to do. We need to do step one, because that happens even if their list is empty. Then we also need to do step two, setting the new node's next field to null. Then we check if the list is empty, which it is, and we set the head to the new node and return. So let's say that's two steps, checking if the list is empty and then setting the head to the new node. So that's gonna give us four steps when the list is empty. Now let's see if n is equal to one, what happens? Well, we go ahead and we do this step again, that's one. Then we do this for two. Then we do, the list isn't empty, so we don't really need to do this, but we do need to check it. So that's one, two, three. Then we go ahead and loop through the list. So for every node in the list, we do these two things. We check if this is the last node, and if not, we move on to the next node. So that's one, two, three, four, five steps. And then we do this last step. Setting the node's next field to the new node is six. So when we have one node in our list, we're doing six steps. Now, some of this is sort of a little bit vague because like, you know, when I, I count this step three here as two steps for when n is equal to zero, um, but it doesn't really matter too much because as we're see, this is only going to be sort of like a rough way of doing it. So let's carry on though and say when n is equal to two and see what happens. So when n is equal to two, there's two nodes in the link list. We go ahead and we do this step, and we do this step, and we do this step. Then we get to the loop, and now for every node in the list, we do two things. We check if it's the last node, and then if not, we move on to the next node. So we do this one, two, three, four steps for this loop now, because there's two nodes in the list. And then we do this node over here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps of this operation now. So that's eight. And then we can carry on with this table. Maybe you're seeing the pattern, but we're gonna go ahead and see when n is equal to three, we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 steps, right? Because we have to do each of these instructions in the loop body one time for every node that's in our link list. So that gets us to 10, like that. Now let's just do one more and think about this. If we have four nodes in the linked list, we have to do one, two, three, four. These instructions, steps one, two, three, and five happen the same for every of these instances. It doesn't matter how many nodes are in the linked list, we do each of these things one time. But inside of the loop body here, we have to do these once for every node in the linked list. So now we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and our total number of steps is 12. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to extrapolate from here. We don't need to go through it any further, I don't think, because if we have, let's say, 10 for n, then let's think about how many steps we would need. We would need one, two, three, four for sure, because steps one, two, three, and five we do regardless of how many nodes are in the link list. So we have those four for sure, plus two, because there's two instructions in the loop, two times however big our list is. So that would be plus two times 10, which is equal to 24. So we can extrapolate out that if we have 10 nodes in our list, we're gonna take 24 steps in this algorithm. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to write this as a function of n. So our steps as a function of n is equal to, if we think about it, four plus two times by n because the four right here, that comes from sort of our base case right here. 
no matter how many nodes are in the linked list, we are always doing these four instructions, basically, these four. But then our two, this coefficient right here, comes from how many instructions are inside the loop body. Every new node we add to the linked list adds these two new instructions that have to be done to loop through that linked list node. And then the n is the input size, the size of the linked list in this case. So we're writing steps here as a function of n. And that's how we can see how this is going to scale up as the list gets bigger and bigger. So then if you think back to your like algebra class, you can sort of graph this kind of thing as well. So the y-intercept here is 4, and the slope of it is 2, so it's going to look like this. As the size of the linked list increases, so too does the number of steps the algorithm needs increases as well. But in algorithm analysis, we're actually never going to really be this specific as giving an exact function for the number of steps an algorithm requires. And the reason is, is that we don't actually know that this four here is right. Because that's just very dependent on the way that I worded this algorithm. If you think about it, create the new node with the right data. In Java, that would actually sort of take probably two steps the way we wrote this when we did our linked list code. Let me make some space on the board here. Okay, that's better. So if we were actually going to write step one here in a Java program, we would maybe write something like this, like node, new node, equals new node. And then we would go ahead and say new node dot data is equal to whatever's passed in. And so this could actually expand out to be two Java instructions like this. But in actual fact, it's maybe even more than that because when we go ahead and do this, we would be calling upon the constructor of the node class, which in this case, I don't think we had one, so it wouldn't really matter. But it's not really clear looking at an algorithm necessarily exactly how many lines of Java code something is going to expand out into. Even more importantly, these two lines of Java code are going to take significantly different amounts of time to execute. This first one here is going to take way more time because when we call upon new node like this, um, this is sort of getting into the details of how the Java virtual machine works, but the Java virtual machine maintains the heap. We talked earlier in the semester about heap memory and stack memory. And when you ask for heap memory by calling on the new operator like this, it has to go through and find you space to store the thing that you want to store. And that takes a reasonable amount of time to go ahead and do. It takes a decent amount of time. And this line of code, however, is just assigning a variable into another variable is going to be very, very quick. So not all of these statements are created equal. So it really doesn't make sense to be so specific and say exactly four is the y-intercept of this function, essentially. It's just, we can't really know that. All right, and likewise, it doesn't really make sense to be as specific as saying two right here in our coefficient for n. We can't really know that because again, what that comes from is it comes from the number of steps inside of the loop body here, which we said was two. But that's just the way this algorithm is worded. You know, if we wrote this in code, it would be something like this, maybe like while, I guess, node.next doesn't equal null, go ahead and say node equals node.next, something like that. And when this gets compiled, <clears throat> there's actually a couple of things happening we have to go ahead and do this comparison, and we have to go ahead and do this assignment update, and then we also have to have a jump back to the top of the loop, which is sort of implied by the while statement, but when you compile this Java code, it is actually gonna go ahead and put the jump in there. So this is actually sort of kind of three statements, but the thing about algorithm analysis is we want it to be based just on the algorithm itself. We don't wanna to have to think about implementation details in a specific language because this is gonna get you know, translated from an algorithm into actual programming language code. But then that programming language code is going to get compiled down into some kind of machine language. In this case, it would be the Java bytecode. And then that's actually going to get run on the machine. And different instructions take different amounts of time to run on a machine. 
For instance, doing a multiplication typically takes a lot longer than an addition in, in the way that processors work. But we do not want to think in that level of detail. And so what I'm telling you is that we're not going to say that this takes exactly two steps here or this takes exactly four steps here. Instead, we're going to basically just simplify this expression and just say that the number of steps as a function of n is equal to on the order of n, which we're going to say is big O of n, which means that it's some kind of linear relationship. As you increase the size of the linked list, it takes linearly more time to go ahead and do this add operation. So that's just sort of a simplification because we don't want to think in the level of detail of figuring out what this constant is here or figuring out what this coefficient is here. We could have this be like an 11, you know, based, based on how many actual machine operations these algorithm instructions take. And maybe this here is a seven, you know, based on how many machine operations these two instructions take. But the fact is we don't really know or frankly care what those numbers are. So we're just going to ignore them and say that the steps as a function of n is equal to big O of n. Then if I was going to graph this again, we wouldn't be specific, but we would know that this is some kind of line. You know, maybe it goes like this, maybe it goes like that, maybe it goes like this. It doesn't really matter. It's just some kind of a linear relationship between the two things. And so we will also say that this is a linear algorithm. Hopefully that makes some sense. Basically, we're just looking at the algorithm and seeing how it scales. Does it scale linearly, as in this case, or does it scale more or less than linear? We're going to look at some other examples, some that scale more than linearly and some that scale less than linearly. Let's take a look at another example now, which is the other program that we ran in the beginning of this video. This algorithm, if you remember, is the one that adds to the end of a singly linked list. Let's go ahead and do the same analysis for a doubly linked list. All right, so here's that algorithm, the one to add to the end of a doubly linked list. And let's go ahead and do the same exercise where we think about how the number of steps of the algorithm is changing in regards to n. Well, let's start again with n is equal to zero. Well, if n is equal to zero, we go ahead and we do step one and we do step two. And the list is empty. So now we're going to do step three, step 3.1 here, 3.2, and 3.3, and then return. So in this case, we've done one, two, three, four, five steps. Now let's carry on and think about when n is equal to one. Well, we're going to do one, two. Now the list is not empty, so we do three, four, five steps. Five. Now what if n is equal to two, though? Well, we're going to do one, two, three, four, five steps. And maybe you're seeing a pattern here. If we have n is equal to three, we do one, two, three, four, five steps. n is equal to four, guess what? It's five steps. n is equal to a thousand, it's five steps. And so as you can see, there's no actual loop in here. And so we always run the same amount of instructions and it just so happened that with the if statement, either side of the if statement took the same amount of steps. And so regardless of how big the linked list gets, it takes the same number of steps to go ahead and add to the end of that linked list. So if we were to go ahead and write steps as a function of the input size n, like here, we would just say steps of n is equal to five, which if we were to graph it, it would look just like this with the y-intercept of being five. And it's basically just a horizontal line. It doesn't matter how many Oops, that's not right. It doesn't matter how big your input size n gets. It doesn't matter how many nodes are in the linked list. The number of steps taken by this algorithm remains constant. It remains flat at five. And now just like last time, I'm gonna argue that we don't actually know or care if this number is exactly five or not. It might actually be seven, right? It might be less, it might be three potentially because it's based on how many actual steps this takes. And this is not actually in Java code, this is just in pseudocode. So it could be potentially actually more when we go ahead and write this actually as Java code. And then when we compile that Java code, it might compile into more bytecode instructions for the Java virtual machine. 
and the Java virtual machine usually is actually pretty complicated. And then it will go ahead and compile out those down to the machine code of the machine we're actually running this on. And because of all those layers of abstraction that we don't want to have to think about when we're doing algorithm analysis, we're just going to say this is some kind of constant. And we're going to say that the steps of n is just equal to big O of one. We use this to mean any kind of constant number. It could be 50, it could be a thousand, it doesn't matter, but it remains flat, whatever it is, as n increases, it does not increase the number of steps. That's big O of one, which is also called constant time. And now we have the result that our, let me make some space first. Okay, there we go. So now we have the result that are adding to the end of the singly linked list, our add single program was a big O of n algorithm. And now our add double algorithm is a big O of one algorithm like this. And so now we can objectively say that this is a better algorithm, not because of the time it took to run it, although we did see that was pretty substantial, but we can say that this is a lower value as n increases this scales perfectly ideally. It doesn't scale up at all, whereas this scales with the input size increasing. So as the input size increases, the number of time it takes to execute the algorithm increases linearly. And so that's what the goal of algorithm analysis is, is we can say something sort of objective about these different algorithms. This one is big O of one constant time, and this one is big O of n linear time. And the goal is always to be as low as possible. We're going to see in the next couple of videos that you can have a big O even higher than big O of N. And you can also have big O that's in between N and one. Big O of one though, however, is pretty much the perfect, as best as you can do of, of you know, not scaling at all. So as we go ahead and go on with the next two videos in this week, we're gonna see sort of more examples. The second video, talks about the mathematical definition of big O, which I think is important to go into, even if it's just a little bit abstract, because it tells you that the, you know, getting rid of the constant and getting rid of the coefficient isn't just hand wavy, like, oh, let's just ignore this part, but it actually has like a mathematical definition because algorithm analysis is sort of like a precise science. It's not just hand waviness. And so that's what the next one is going to talk about, sort of the math behind Big O. Then the third video is just going to be examples, looking at more algorithms and finding the Big O for those algorithms. So I will see you in those videos. Thanks.